Hi, and welcome to the next installment in our First John series. Before we begin, I want to let you know about a little something that's coming over the next two weeks. You do not want to miss it. Next week and the week after, on these Thursday night broadcasts at 7 p.m., I'm going to be sitting down with Pastor Daryl Del Husse for a little mini-series called Old Wisdom for Young Hearts. We're gonna take a two-week break from 1 John. We've been going hard, we've been going deep, we've talked about a lot of heavy doctrinal material, and that's good, and that is still practical. But I also wanna take some time here and there in our ministry season to address uh, subjects like money, and the future, and planning, and dating, and courtship, and marriage, and relationship. And so I could think of nothing better than to take a little summer break, brief, two weeks from 1 John, and give you interviews with wise pastors like Pastor Daryl. He's one of the pastors here at Redeemer, and he's been in ministry for many decades and married to his beautiful bride, Holly, for 50 years this June 20th. And so don't miss that. Mark your calendar. I would even get some friends together, do a watch party. Or if you're a family, this would be something really good for parents and teenagers or even college students to watch together because a lot of the subjects are things you probably talk about in your home, like finances, work, the future. What are you going to do? Who are you going to be? Who are you going to date? Who are you going to marry? Are you going to stay pure? What if you slip up? What if you sin? What if you make mistakes? And what if you don't know what to do at all? These interviews are going to address that. And so don't miss the next two Thursday nights at 7 p.m. right here for the gathering crew and you who are watching from wherever you are. Now, to tonight's study. The message is called Real Atonement. I want you to turn in your Bible to 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. One verse, we're going to read the text and then jump right in. John writes, He, meaning Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Uh, what comes to mind when I say the word atonement? What about when I say the word sacrifice? What do you think about when I bring up the idea of reconciling with someone? What begins to flow through your mind? Uh, maybe a, a breakup in a relationship. Maybe conflict with your parents or a friend or another relative or uh, somebody from church or in your community. What about when I say the word justice? Do you think about something being made right? Do you think about maybe even vengeance? Eye for eye, skin for skin. Well, the word atonement, the idea of justice, the concept of being paid back or reconciling with someone is one that is very clear in Scripture. And it is so important that you understand how those particular concepts are viewed by God. What God has to say about reconciliation, what he has to say about paying someone back, about justice, about making things right. Because the question really is, what does justice demand? When you've been hurt, if you were in court, and you were the victim of a crime, what is the job of the judge? The job of the judge is to rightly judge, to find a person guilty or not guilty. Well, so it is with God. He looks upon each individual, every human who's ever lived, every image bearer, and one day he will determine guilty or not guilty. Tonight, our passage has a lot to say about God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and what it took for him to look upon sinners and say, not guilty. It doesn't just happen. A lot of people think, well, God just loves everyone. It'll be okay. No, it took something incredible for God to look upon you and say, not guilty to say justified, to say no longer condemned, to be out of that orange jumpsuit and back in to your community, back in to real life. 
And so the first thing that I want you to understand from this text is point number one in your notes, and it is face the brutality of the atonement. We need to face the brutality of the atonement. And you're going to understand pretty quickly what the atonement is. John writes, he is the propitiation. We'll stop right there. Jesus is the propitiation. John is speaking uh, about Jesus, and the central goal of this entire section to paint a picture for people, his readers, in understanding what Jesus did, who he is, and how he is the advocate who represents us, the one whose blood cleanses us from all sin, the one whom we confess our sins to. He is the propitiation for our sins. Big church word. Propitiation is a Greek word that means atonement. And atonement is defined as, as you follow along your screen, if you want to hit pause, write this down or take a screenshot, that which appeases anger and brings reconciliation with someone who has reason to be angry. Well, this is a doctrine, a big one in Christianity, and it is the doctrine of penal substitutionary atonement. Some of you are like, what? Yeah, just a big long phrase, penal, like penalty, substitutionary. Jesus was the substitute atonement. He made it right. He appeased the anger of God. As we just read, the definition of atonement is appeasing someone who has reason to be angry. So penal, Jesus paid the penalty. Substitutionary, he was the substitute. Well, who was supposed to be in that position? You, the sinner. Me, the sinner. And then atonement, he made it right. That is penal substitutionary atonement. He took upon the wrath of God. You say, well, why did did he do that? Why is God wrathful? Well, God must punish sin. He pours out his wrath on the unrighteous. He pours out his wrath on sin. Because of Adam's sin, man was separated from God. We can no longer have a wonderful, beautiful, open, unconditional relationship with God. Sin made a chasm between us and God thanks to Adam and Eve. So God can't just allow us to walk across and go hang with him. We've often said, hey, Jesus is not your homeboy. He's not some, you know, little guy or some, you know, a big guy in the sky or whatever you see. Sometimes people will say at funerals, you know, I've seen this before where, you know, they'll get really irreverent. And I've seen one guy even crack a beer before and go, hey man, you have one up there with Jesus and I'll be up there soon to have another one with you. You know, people think heaven is just some party that Jesus is just some dude? No. He is a holy God. God is a holy God. He doesn't just let people waltz into heaven. There's a seriousness and a weightiness. And so that chasm of sin can't just be crossed. You don't just go, hey, what's up, Jesus? No. Something must be done to close the gap between a holy God and unholy, irreverent, unrighteous sinners. God made it possible through Jesus to have relationship again, to be close with him. Jesus made it possible. There was healing between a holy God and sinful men, all because of wrath, because of atonement, because Jesus was killed on the cross. He gave his life He had to take the penalty as a substitute for your sin to atone for death or for sin and to appease the anger of God in his death. Now, unfortunately, there are some people who hate this kind of teaching today. They will say what I have just described as mean-spirited, unloving, shallow, legalistic, They'll say that God is nothing more than some bloodthirsty cosmic child abuser who assaulted and killed his own son for a bunch of people. People will say a God of love would never be so angry. God would never do something like that. We say, well, then how do they claim sin is dealt with? Well, there's a couple of ways. The first one is some people will say Jesus was just a moral example. You know, the atonement, 
Look, that was just Jesus. He was just laying down his life. It was an act of love. It was just morality. And in that, that's a great example for us for how to counteract sin, how sin is dealt with, why God loves us and says, hey, just follow that guy's example and everything's gonna be okay. Now listen, there is some truth there, right? Jesus laid down his life. He was a moral example. He is so full of love. It's all good. We should follow after him, but that's not how sin is dealt with. God's anger is not appeased because Jesus was morally perfect. Another one that people say, no, uh, a phrase, Christus victor, or Christ is victorious, a phrase that refers to Jesus dying then raising again. So in other words, hey, look at me. I beat death. I rose up again. I'm victorious over death. Believe in me and you'll be victorious too over sin and over death. And then one day you can come to heaven. Listen, you already know and I both know there's truth to that, isn't there? But that's not it. That's a great what, right? What? Well, Jesus is victorious. That's great information, but that is not a how. That is not how sin was dealt with or how God's anger was appeased. People lean into these theories because it softens the wrath of God. It softens the anger of God, the idea that God would punish sin. People don't like that. They run from it. They don't want to admit that God's wrath must be satisfied or that they stand judged and condemned if they don't repent of their sin. There are people who work very hard at counteracting the doctrine of penal substitutionary atonement. A lot of it is based on emotion. Very little of it, if any of it, is based on what is called exegesis or exegetical proof. That's like when pastors or scholars or professors look at the Bible, break it down into the original languages, look at interpretation, look at cross-references, look at the whole Bible, look at the author, the audience, the context, and they understand, well, this is really what this is saying. That's called exegesis to dig out or excavate a passage. No, when people push back against the wrath of God and this concept that we're talking about in the atonement tonight, they don't use exegetical proof, they just use emotional proof. Hey, I don't like how that feels. Why would a loving God kill his son? Or, you know, the God I believe in would never pour out wrath on people. He's just, that sounds so angry. You know, some have even said that the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the New Testament. That the guy in the Old Testament, oh, he was just some angry, big, you know, God. And then he either evolved, some say, he changed, some say. Others have even argued it's a different God altogether. And the God in the New Testament is love. It's like a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Hollywood Jesus who just holds little lammies and kisses babies and never says anything or does anything that would make people upset. You know what the reality is? This is deception. This is Satan doing his best to twist something so beautiful. Yes, it was brutal, but the atonement was beautiful. It was still a moment of love in the midst of wrath. Because John 3.16 still reminds us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave, he gave him up. It's true. The wrath of God had to be satisfied. 1 Peter 2.24 reminds us, he himself bore our sins on his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And then get this, you can see it on your screen. By his wounds, you have been healed. By his morality, uh, by his victory, by his long hair and Hollywood robe, no, by his wounds. He was wounded for our transgressions. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for our sake, he, meaning God the Father, made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. God the Father smite his son, made him sin. Some have said it this way and they're absolutely correct. Jesus became a curse 
for you and I to appease the wrath of God. The second Thessalonians 1, 5 through 10. It's gonna be on your screen. It's five verses. Read it with me, slide by slide. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Paul talking to the Thessalonian Christians. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. Now don't miss this. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed that is a God who deals with sin. Jesus is a righteous judge. God's wrath had to be satisfied. Our God, the blessed Trinity, deals with sin. He does not look over it unless there is a perfect atoning sacrifice. There must be blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. And so you say, well, what do I do with that? What, 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 how do you want me to apply this, Kosti? Well, don't run from the truth about God's wrath. Run towards it. Face the brutality of the cross. Look upon the the bloody face of Christ. Look upon the nails in his hands. Look upon the pierced side. Look upon the shameful crown of thorns upon his brow. Look upon his feet. Look upon him on the cross. In your mind, think about the wrath of God falling upon him as he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And realize that was for you. Face the brutality of it. It was was a substitutionary atonement. You should have been and should be on that cross, but he was. And what does that do? It ignites worship, doesn't it? Because if you're like so many, what do you want to say? Thank you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I'm grateful to you, Jesus. I don't deserve this, Jesus. That's why we sing songs What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We sing songs like all glory be to Christ our King. All glory be to Christ. His rule and reign will ever, will never cease. All glory be to Christ. Why? Because of what he did. He is high and exalted because he came humbly, hung on a cross, for you. Face the brutality of that. Uh, When the American financier, the great banker, John Pierpont Morgan, you might know him as J.P. Morgan, died in 1913. Uh, in In his will, he had written these words, I commit my soul into the hands of my Savior in full confidence that having received it and washed it in his most precious blood, he will present it faultless before the throne of my heavenly Father. And I entreat my children to maintain and defend at all hazard and at any cost of personal sacrifice. This is a banker talking now with a lot of money. The blessed doctrine of the complete atonement for sin through the blood of Jesus Christ once offered and through that alone. Even the greatest banker or one of the greatest bankers in our modern day history, J.P. Morgan, associated with Chase Bank, understood that the greatest price ever paid had nothing to do with money. It had nothing to do with bank loans or the acquisition of great properties or the building of great companies. Rather, it was about a price paid with blood. Jesus' blood. Let it be said that you and I spend our days, no matter how successful we are, making much of the atoning work of Christ on the cross And that even in our our last will and testament, it's lit a flame with worship and passion 
as we point to the one who paid our debt. The second thing that I want you to see from this text and understand from this text is that you ought to flourish in the blessing of the atonement. Flourish in the blessing of the atonement. John continues to write in the rest of the verse, for our sins, you can underline or circle our, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Who is the atonement applied to? Believers. Who is included in that? Us. John's use here of of cosmos of the world shows that God's arm in saving people is not too short. He doesn't just save one kind of people or one people in one location or one people who have this skin color or that skin color or speak that language or that language or are just rich or are just poor. He saves and extends salvation to nations, tribes, tongues of all kinds. That was a little bit of news, remember, for the Jews who kind of thought, hey, we're it, we're God's people. And then he says, well, I'm going to graft in some Gentiles too. A beautiful picture. Like Acts 1.8 reminds us, when Jesus is telling his disciples, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth, the remotest parts of the earth, some translations say. Now, this is contrary to what false teachers were teaching in John's day. They were saying what some of our uh, today's TBN prosperity preachers like to say. They were saying they were extra enlightened. You ever met somebody who says, hey, I'm more anointed than you are. I got a real in connection with God. You should listen to me. Hey, God told me, fill in the blank. You know, God told me this, that you should listen to me. They claim to be apostles and prophets and all sorts of things. Well, there were people in John's day that were acting like they had a real extra special in with God as well. And it was kind of like, hey, you know, he, he only atoned for me and us. We're extra special, extra anointed, extra enlightened. Well, John crushes that. He goes, hey, I got news for you. Guess what? In our city, in our town, in our country, in our state, in our world, across the board, every color, creed, nation, tribe, and tongue, he's saving people from all places. Not just you, anointed ones, self-appointed ones, John's crushing what the false teachers were teaching, trying to abuse people, manipulate people, and control people with their supposed inside track. All show, no go. No power. Weakness. Fake. Manipulation. Nothing more than tricks and false doctrine. But John says, we got the real thing. Here's real atonement. Here's real blessing. Guess what? You can all be anointed. Hey, guess what? You can all get the inside track with God. Hey, guess what? You can all have the guaranteed blessings that are all wrapped up in the atonement. All of you can. Here's the beautiful thing. Uh, There are five that I want to give you tonight. There's more. I could make this list for hours, but I want to give you five that you can take away. The first great blessing, a beautiful result of the atonement. Uh, Blessing number one is right relationship with God. Right relationship with God. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 19, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. You know, you and I have no chance at enjoying a relationship with God if it wasn't for Jesus, but because of the atonement, hey, you you get to call him Father, You have amazing access to God. You don't have to pray to anybody but God. You get to go to him no matter how your earthly father is, whether he's a great man or a challenging man to call your dad, your heavenly father allows you to access him as a child. You have a perfect father in heaven. You've been reconciled to him. He loves you. You don't have to work hard for his attention. 
you, because of the atonement, get to have a beautiful relationship with God. And then Paul's talking about a ministry of reconciliation being offered to others because really when you have an amazing relationship with God, what do you want to do? You go tell people, oh, you got to have what I have. i got to share this with you. Look what God has done for me and in me. He can do that for you and in you too. You want other people to come to know him as father. Number two, another blessing that results from the atonement. No condemnation for sin. Amen. From wherever you are, wherever you're watching this, that's got to be an amen. The atonement guarantees that you are not going to get to the heavenly courts one day and, and experience whiplash. Like God lured you in with this church thing like it's all gonna be okay and Jesus died for your sin and then you're gonna get there and you're gonna get slapped upside the side of your head as he says, hey, gotcha. I'm gonna judge you for all your sins now. In fact, now that I got you here, I wanna really punish you. No. Romans 8, 1 says, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Oh, we've talked before, gathering family. Sin has consequences, but when you are a believer in Christ, sin does not have any condemnation attached to it. You will get to heaven and you will have sinned. You will have made mistakes. Even church leaders, even pastors, even your parents, even your teachers, even the best, seemingly best Christians, they sin and they need grace and to turn to Christ and confess that sin. But there is no condemnation when you get to heaven. That is a relief. That's a blessing. The next one, you get eternal life. Immortality. Eternal life. Living forever with God. The atonement guarantees that this life will not be your best life. And if this life is your best life, that means you went to hell when it was all said and done. So sure, if you want to reject God and live it up and do whatever you want and call this your best life now, well, you're probably right. It's going to be your best life now. But if you're a believer and you're covered by the blood of Jesus, and you are experiencing the now but not yet blessings that are all wrapped up in the atoning work of Christ on the cross, let me tell you, it doesn't matter how good your life is here on earth, the greatest life awaits you in heaven. And it doesn't matter how bad or depressed or broken your life is here on earth. What awaits you in heaven because of the atonement is more beautiful than you could ever imagine. John 10, verse 27 and 28, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. You know nobody can steal your salvation. If you ever hear somebody pray that you can lose your salvation or you're gonna backslide or yeah, they were a Christian, but man, they really, they just fell away from the faith. No, uh, we'll actually study later on in John's letter that they went out from among us or they stopped seeming like they were a Christian because they really never were a real Christian. If you are really saved and really atoned for, let me tell you, you might struggle. You might have some challenges in life. There might be some broken moments, but I'll tell you this, you will continue to persevere because you are one of his kids. You're gonna make it and he will make sure you do. Eternal life is guaranteed in the atonement. Number four, Another blessing. No more pain, crying, sadness, or death. You want to cross out sadness and put depression? You want to cross out pain and put sickness? You could. All those things are part of those feelings or those experiences. And for some of you, this is the best news you've ever heard. No more depression one day, no more tears of sadness, no more broken relationships, no more bad breakups, no more confusion, no more sicknesses like cancer, touching the people that we love, killing them and taking things away from us that we hold on to so dear. And yes, Jesus is still a healer and he definitely heals people. But I'll tell you right now, he's so much more than a healer. And even when the healing doesn't come on earth, you get to look forward to a moment that Revelation 21 4 talks about that says he will wipe away every tear from their eyes death will be no more 
Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. That's a beautiful guarantee in the atonement. That's a day I can't wait for. I'm looking forward to it. Because of Christ, I can trust the promise that it's actually going to happen. Another one, fifth and final result. Beautiful blessing of the atonement. A perfectly glorified body. Okay, so personal moment here. This one's always been one of my favorites. Uh, I can't wait to see what the glorified body is gonna look like, feel like, be like. Uh, Jesus atones for sin, guarantees that this old crummy mummy, this old shell, it's gonna die, it's gonna go back to dust, and then what gets raised to life one day in him and through him by his power is gonna be different. It'll be spiritual, a different body. So, hey, no more keto, no more Whole30, uh, no more worrying about if you're fit or not, doing some program to try to get bigger biceps or you know, make the girls like you or the guys like you, whatever. You don't have to worry about perfect body syndrome. Glorified bodies, a beautiful thing. One of God's wonders. I don't know if we're gonna be able to fly all over the place and explore galaxies. I don't know how we'll be able to think or move or what it'll all look like, but the Bible teaches there will be an incredible supernatural experience and you and I have never seen the likes of it before. 1 Corinthians 15 is the chapter you want to study when you're talking about the glorified body. Paul, in verses 35 and 36a, and then verse 40 and 42, says, someone will ask, how are the dead raised? You know, the, the Corinthian Christians maybe had some questions about these things. With what kind of body do they come? He says, you foolish person, in verse 36, you know Paul, tells it like it is. Verse 40, there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. In other words, an immortal, spiritual, incredible body, a glorified body awaits because of the atonement. And look, some of you are like, whatever, I don't care. But some of you, your body doesn't work too well. Maybe you're in a wheelchair. Maybe you experience a lot of pain. Maybe you're short and people make fun of you. Maybe you're, you're tall and, and, and lanky and skinny and people make fun of that. Uh, maybe your, your size is something that you know, people poke fun at and you think, man, I, I need to lose more weight or I need to have more muscles or I need to look good for somebody to love me. The atonement crushes all of that. Those are satanic lies meant to steal your joy. You are beautiful just the way you are. You are one of God's kids just the way you are. There is somebody and there are people who love you just the way you are. And guess what? This whole thing, you can have all the six-pack abs and do your hair and get your nails did and whatever else you wanna do. Guess what? It's all fading. One day, it doesn't matter how young and fit you are, you are gonna be wrinkly and old and weak and you're gonna limp around and you're gonna play basketball like I did 14 weeks ago before COVID-19 put us all in quarantine and some 16 year old's gonna run into your leg and you're not an athlete anymore and you limp around still 14 weeks later. You are gonna be old and stuff ain't gonna work the way it used to. And guess what? You'll find out looks are only skin deep. And what Proverbs 31 says about a godly woman is true. Eh, beauty is fleeting, charm's deceitful, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And you'll find out how important it is to live out the words, young man, that Paul told men at Corinth to act like a man, to stand firm, serve the Lord. That's why it matters. There's a day coming where we're gonna be in glory. It's gonna be different, it's gonna be beautiful. And the question becomes, how did you live out your life on earth because of what Christ has done for you? How are you living out the blessings and the benefits of the atonement? His blood wasn't wasted. His atoning work accomplished exactly what it was purposed to do. 
Jesus wasn't up there, you know, on the cross or maybe in heaven before or after, kind of with his fingers crossed going, hey, Abba Father, I really hope this thing works, man. I really hope someone picks me. I really hope the blood works. I really hope it'll save somebody. Man, I really don't know if all that was worth it. No, he knew exactly what he was doing on the cross, who he was doing it for, how it would be worked out, and that you and I would have purpose through him and in him forevermore. Not a drop wasted, not a breath wasted by our Lord. That's why Charles Spurgeon called the atonement the miracle of all miracles. And so the questions come. Do you relish in the atonement and what Christ has done on the cross? Or are you caught up in the things of this world? Are you ignited into greater levels of worship Are you convicted, even by a message like this, into greater levels of worship, submission, abandonment of the old ways of worldly pursuits, and throwing yourself into and onto Jesus because of what he has done on the cross for you? Does it ignite worship in you? Is your relationship with God one of separation or one of reconciliation? I want that for you. And so as you reflect on tonight's message and as you reflect on even those questions, I wanna pray together to close, asking Jesus to do a mighty work in our hearts. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your son. Thank you for his work on the cross. Forgive us for, at times, not caring or appreciating it. Forgive us for getting caught up in the pursuits of this world Lord Jesus, if it has not happened yet, please awaken the hearts of young people watching this. Save them. Draw them to yourself. Open their blind eyes to see that you are the greatest treasure they could ever have on this earth, in this life, and on to the next. Thank you that you took on the cross. Thank you for suffering through the brutality of the atonement and for providing for all of us who are yours the beautiful blessings that are all wrapped up in your sacrifice. We know you are gonna continue to save people from all over the world. We know that at any given moment, as we share the gospel with people, you could be saving another soul. And so help those of us who are saved to live out that salvation, to share the ministry, the message of reconciliation with others, that they may also come to know you, Father, as their Abba, and Jesus as the propitiation, the atonement for their sin, and their Lord and Savior. We pray this in your name. Amen and amen. We'll see you next week for the special interviews with Pastor Daryl Del Husse, the mini-series for two weeks called old wisdom for young hearts. Until then, keep serving the Lord. We'll see you again. Hey, thanks for watching. If you have questions, thoughts, or you just want to share your story or need prayer, send an email to info at redeemeraz.org. And if you haven't already, be sure to hit subscribe on our YouTube channel as we do this every single week so you can get notified when new resources are available. Lastly, be sure to follow us on Instagram for videos, updates, and resources there as well. Thank you for studying God's word with us, and we pray that it continues to sharpen you for his glory and your good. We'll see you next time.